Hey, y'all. Welcome to a yet-to-be-named basketball podcast. I'm Samson Folk, and Evan has been so very gracious to allow us to host our, what would it be, a, we've, we've come together to talk about basketball for the rest of the season, or the start of the season, through the rest of the season. But most importantly for now, we're here to talk about seven teams. And if this gets a really good response, maybe we can stretch that out a bit. But seven teams for now, the first of which the Wolves, and we're previewing their season. Kind of like if you think about Jalen and Bill, what they used to do. Um, Less budget, better insights, maybe. Evan, how do you feel about the Wolves right now, man? I'm feeling good about it, just because I dove into a lot a lot, a lot of Wolves film. Watched a whole lot of Cat. Carl Anthony Towns is so good, man. He's so good. You're talking about a guy who's, you know, we'll have all the stats here, but he's seven feet tall. He's shooting 50, 40, 80. And that 40 is on 7.9 three-point attempts per game. That's crazy. Yeah, he, he kind of drives the team. You know, we, we talked about this before, but I likened it to the Wolves have likely a top 10 offense in waiting. They just have to take the keys and turn the car on. And that's what Carl Anthony Towns provides. He's one of the most fantastic offensive initiators from the post that we've ever seen. As you alluded to, that 7.9 three-point attempts per game, that's big time. That's huge. That's not something you see very often. And 41%? On those shots, you have 1.7 a game that are pull-ups too. It's not just a guy who's hitting wide open shots. He shoots good when there's tight defense. He shoots good when he's open. His mechanics are tight. His balance is great. And he leads that team in. And he's a beast in the post. What I'm wondering is that the Wolves, they've, they've had him since they drafted him. Obviously, duh. 2015, he's the first overall draft pick. They recognized early on that he was very much this massively dominant post presence. And then the shooting came along and everyone said, okay, there's something special here. So they decided to try and build around him very quickly, which is good because a lot of teams wait four or five years. They were, it was basically the end of year two where they said, okay, we have to get this guy a lot of help. They tried to get Jimmy Butler in. That ended in chaos. They're both separately very good players. Jimmy Butler even probably leapfrogging Carl Anthony Towns on most of the top whatever player lists. And then you look at, they trade Jimmy Butler. They have the blog boy version of the team with the 76ers offshoots and Robert Covington, where their defense jumped like 12 spots right after he joined. And it's a really interesting team. And now you have the D'Angelo Russell, Carl Anthony Towns vibes version for lack of a better term. What do you make of this team? Where do they sit in the West for you? So I think it's important to note that our traditional thinking of one through eight playoff teams is out the window, at least for this season. So you talk, you're, you have to think about it in terms of one through six, because those are the locks, and then seven through 10. So for my tiers, I have, you know, LA is in a class of their own. Then you have teams that could, you know, if things break right, if they lock in, they could potentially be in the finals, win the championship, things like that. So I have the next tier, the Clippers, and then in the same tier, but slightly below, Portland, Dallas, Denver, Utah. I would say Houston, but there's so much unknown. John Wall hasn't played in two years. James Harden, is he going to get traded? I don't know. I would bet if Harden stays that they make the playoffs, but those are those teams. And now you have to think about, so the only teams I have out of the playoff hunt are Sacramento and Oklahoma City. That leaves Golden State and Phoenix as the two teams I I feel are going to make the playoffs just because you put Chris Paul 
and Steph Curry and the guys they have around them in a one or two game series, winner take all games, I, I wouldn't bet against either of those guys. Then you have uh, San Antonio is a team that doesn't beat itself, but is lacking in terms of the talent level and cohesiveness. Are they the team that we saw before the bubble? Are they going to commit to the team that we saw during the bubble? And then you have teams that are as confusing as New Orleans, because we don't really know what they will be. And then you have Minnesota who, you know, if they hand Cat the keys and he goes, he takes a step up defensively and he leads them and continues doing what he did offensively last year. You know, they have a puncher's chance at making the playoffs and making, making some noise in the playoffs, not necessarily winning a series, but, you know, giving a higher seed a really, really hard time. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I'll put the graphic up here right now, but the most intriguing additions, I think, if we're looking at Minnesota's team this year, is Anthony Edwards. Obviously, he's a big deal, first overall pick, as one of the most explosive physical and athletic profiles that's ever been measured. He's, he's obviously very, very intriguing for this team. And Ricky Rubio comes back into Minnesota, a place he loves, a place he's ready to take a role as a veteran in. And so those guys figure in in a big way. So let's try and figure out what this team looks like. D'Angelo Russell, Carl Anthony Towns, obviously headlining the team. One more so, the other less so. And Anthony Edwards, a player who coming out of college was deemed as like the half court god in college because it was this, in isolation, he was overwhelming. He can handle the ball. He doesn't have an extremely consistent jump shot, but he can hit jumpers. He was like this throwback, get you a bucket and half court type of player. But joining the Timberwolves, less of those possessions will be his. And how do you think he fits in as an off ball guy? And as far as getting out in transition, hopefully playing along with D'Angelo Russell. And if Carl Anthony Towns is going to be bringing the ball up, like we've talked about before, then that means that Edwards obviously is going to be running the wing. Do you think this is a good fit for him? So, yes and no. A guy like that, to me, it's important to have a lot of structure and have a, a great culture. Not to say the Wolves don't have a great culture, but you know, the more tight things are, the better off they will be. If he is a guy who needs the ball, and I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't watch a lot of Anthony Edwards in college. I'm not, I, people ask me to do college film all the time. I do watch college film, but it's, it's hard for me to project. I just, I just don't have that. If he's a guy who needs the ball, then that's going to be tough because you talk about bringing in D'Angelo, D'Angelo Russell. He's a guy who, who does need the ball. Ricky Rubio, he's a floor raiser, but he's most effective when he has the ball. As we continue to talk about, Carl Anthony Towns is a guy who I would just say, if I'm Ryan Saunders, give him the ball. Let's figure everything else out. So if he can be a guy who and this is something I'm borrowing from you, can punch gaps and be explosive when he does have the ball or learn to be an efficient second side attacker, then I'm sure Ryan Saunders will find a way to utilize him well, but he has to buy into that role. Yeah, I think he has all the Yogi guys who succeed around the league who are great weak side attackers. A guy like Eric Gordon, who is before he became like a really good set shooter from the three point line, he was known in LA as just an explosive, as you said, second side attacker, that secondary play that flows in. There's a moving defense ahead of him. He can attack. He can punch gaps. Anthony Edwards, his physical profile is more impressive than Gordon's, but not too dissimilar. A guy who is less athletic, but just knows how to play within his, his skill set, Norman Powell in Toronto, a really great weak side attacker, has taken on some of those secondary action plays like pin downs after initial action. 
that's all important. And if Edwards can do that kind of stuff, I think he can have a very efficient year in Minnesota. And if they want to give him some primary initiator possessions when D'Lo or Cat is off the floor, provided that they have any minutes like that, then we'll see. But as far as let's talk about not Ricky Rubio, because we'll talk about him later, but Cat and D'Lo. This two-man game provides kind of this idea of, okay, they asked for it. This seems like what they want. And they seem to have great designs of how they fit together. And if you close your eyes and you imagine D'Angelo Russell, his insane shooting ability, he has immaculate touch. Carl Anthony Towns, the same thing, just seven inches taller, which is remarkable. And then you have these guys who are both incredibly gifted passers for their positions. D'Angelo Russell, perhaps one of the 10 best passers in the NBA. You close your eyes and you say, these guys should be able to fit together and make a beautiful offense. Do you think they can do that? I do. And the reason being, like I said, so with these predictions, these team previews, I might be wrong about a lot of things, but that's not because I didn't watch film. I watched a lot of film. And unfortunately, we only saw Kat and Russell play one game together, and that was against the Raptors. And the Raptors, an immense defensive team. So when they ran their pick and rolls, the Raptors would switch a lot. Many of the time he got Fred Van Vliet switched onto him, which he took advantage of. He tried to take advantage of in a number of ways, post-ups, um, spot up a, a pick and pop where he'd shoot straight over Fred. So the foundation is there. It looks like they can work together as a team. My, my question is, will Russell be more willing to give up the ball and play off the ball? Because I think the most dangerous thing that the Wolves can do is to actually make Carl Anthony Towns the pick and roll ball handler. He is a great decision maker and he's just got so many tools at his disposal that if you can turn D'Lo into a pick and pop guy or deal, you know, you make the defense make decisions. And then it's my favorite thing to say, but a second side attack D'Lo can flow into second side attack. Then you start to play with the defense. Is Cat going to slip? Is Cat going to pop? Are they, you know, going to go into double drag action? Things like that. And the most important thing here is the defense will be so occupied by that two-man action that, you know, you got great cutters like Malik Beasley. Josh Okoji is, is growing in that role. If Anthony Edwards turns into a back-cutting lob threat, Things like that, you know, sky's the limit with that action. Yeah, I really like that two-man game too. The potential is sky high. I love that you brought up the inverted pick and roll. That's one of my favorite plays to see on any team. And just seeing how it worked in, like, for example, Golden State was like the peak of it, right? You had KD on ball, Steph Curry setting a screen. Steph Curry, a guy who is a good screen setter, despite being, a, you know, one of the greatest guards of all time. D'Angelo Russell, do you think he learned anything in Golden State? Because he hasn't played with a fantastic big man ever in his career. And Carl Anthony Towns, as far as a big man who has gravity that you can play off of, it doesn't really get better. Draymond Green was kind of not really into it during last season. Do you think that D'Angelo Russell has picked up anything in his career that will allow him to play well off of Carl Anthony Towns' gravity? I do. I think about this a lot in this way. Guys in the locker room, they provide so much value because everybody wants to think about 2K or fantasy basketball, like you're trying to build the best roster. In reality, you have to have good locker room guys. You have to have guys who know their roles, embrace their roles. We can talk about that again. Ricky Rubio ticks that box. But D'Angelo Russell... If you're thinking about Draymond Green's skill set and Carl Anthony Towns' skill set, he, you know, Cat isn't the defender or it seems like the rip your heart out alpha 
that Draymond is. But if you think about skill sets in terms of passing and decision-making, things like that, I think Draymond is, I'm not saying it's a, it's a straight comparison, but Cat has those skills. Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, when he was, you know, on the bench or in practice and things like that, D'Lo got the chance to, you get to pick their brains every single day. And I think that's going to do so much for D'Lo's career if he can sort of, not to say that D'Lo is a selfish guy, but Steph Curry is one of the best teammates of all time, I feel. For a guy with his skill set, his willingness to play off the ball, his willingness to defer and or be a spacing threat and give guys the chance to shine because he knows that's what he'll need in the playoffs and things like that. If D'Lo picked up those lessons and the Warriors used him in isolation and as a pick and roll ball handler, but they used him as a spot up threat and on handoffs, they used him off the ball a little more than I think other teams would have. And so I think he learned to play that way. And I think that's going to do a lot in terms of him and Kat and both of them growing together. Yeah. As you highlight, he's a, he's a good spot up threat. He can shoot the ball and he's such a good passer that him against a moving defense would be great. So in my mind, I look at those two players and I think you want Kat as primary initiator most of the time. You flow to D'Angelo as the release valve, as most guards are. It's rare that a big man is your release valve in your offense. You don't just throw it down in the post. You can if Cat has spacing and he's not going to get doubled and you have to do like side top side action to beat the shot clock. There will be room for a lot of different things for those guys to do. But as it currently stands, I think the way that they're used is Cat as primary. And there's a lot of different ways to use him as primary. And then D'Lo is the king of secondary action and the release valve. And his shot making, I think, will be really backbreaking against a lot of teams if they do that kind of stuff. And Cat will provide already a ton of advantages. You talked about Cat's defense. Let's cover that. Cat, every time you talk about him, you have to talk about the Wolves not being able to win very often. And you have to talk about his defensive shortcomings. Coming out of Kentucky... Cat was known as a defender. I remember that was who he was projected as. He was going to be a really impressive defensive big who had all the tools to come along eventually on offense. And now he's a guy who has all the tools eventually to come along on defense and is this mind-numbingly effective offensive big who could be historically recognized for his repertoire. He's incredible. So his defense, what do you think needs to happen on that end? Does he have what it takes? He absolutely has what it takes. And I will admit to this, I, Kat's rookie year, I came out with a defense video for him because I thought, man, if he is what everybody says he is, he, and he has all these tools and this is only year one, or maybe it was, you know, year two. I thought sky's I keep saying sky's the limit just because Cat is that good. So he ha- he does have all the tools. When he was under Tom Thibodeau, I believe that they stretched him way outside of his comfort zone. And the reason for that being you can teach a guy, you'd rather rein a guy in and see what he's capable of and see how far he can go versus having to teach him to go out. And so I think that, you know, having KG as his mentor early on and having Jimmy Butler there, you know, it didn't, didn't work out, but these are ultimately lessons that will make you better. And so I'm thinking now, is he going to try harder defensively? Maybe now that he knows he has a shot at the playoffs, yes. Maybe, you know, he thought, if I'm the only offensive threat and I have to go for 30 a night against double, triple teams and score all over the court and make all the decisions and things like that, maybe I don't care about the defense as much. We only saw him in, what, 35 35 games last season? So... In those games, he looked, he looked spry. He looked active. 
he looked engaged. Time will tell if that means that he can carry that over to what will be, you know, seven. I, I don't know that he's going to play all 72, but this slog of a season, time will tell. Yeah, you brought up earlier about him against the Raptors where that was the only game that he and D'Lo played and how many different looks were thrown at him. That's because the Raptors didn't have Serge Ibaka or Marcus on that game. So you saw a combination of a lot of switches fronting him in the post. Rondé Hollis Jefferson was, I would consider his primary for most of the game. And so you look at how he was able to dissect the Raptors' incredibly effective defense. The Raptors were no slouch on the defensive end last year. He can read the floor. He can see moving bodies and see where the ball needs to go. You hope that he can invert that idea and know that the ball is going to go places and defensively he has to meet the ball at times like that. We talked about this before and you brought up Robert Covington and how Robert Covington might be able to rub off on Cat. Do you have any thoughts on that now? Yes. So previously I would spoken to you about how Robert Covington is the quintessential 3 and D guy. In reality, he has become less of a... He's still a decent shooter, and he's a solid on-ball defender. But he is elite being that backline helper, being that rim protector. So if Cat can take the lessons learned from that experience, from Robert Covington is not as tall as Carl Anthony Towns, but he, he guards up. He guards way up. Cat can take some of that and some of that, you know, nasty from Rocco and be that type of defender, maybe it matters a little less what he does as the pick as a pick and roll big defender. Right? Because if he doesn't have that there, you can erase the mistakes of your teammates on that back line, then that will more than make up for whatever you're lacking or whatever you're not willing to do at the point of attack. Yeah. And I'm sure, well, we know you do. You have a, like a super cut of just these incredible athletic defensive plays that Carlton Towns has made before these huge sweeping weak side blocks. There's plays. I'm not sure if we have clips of this, but there's plays where you see him hedge and just wall a guy off, corral him to the sideline in the pick and roll. He's capable of so many different things. And if he can read the defense like Robert Covington or even a sliver like Robert Covington and his court mapping gets to the point where he knows where to be far more often than he knows where not to be, that would be great. Because lurkers in the NBA like Kyle Lowry, like Robert Covington, like Jason Tatum, those three guys are excellent near the lane. And the way they use their steps defensively and the way, especially Tatum and Covington, because Lowry is not that long, but especially those guys use their length to blanket and cover like three guys on the floor at a time. Just they know they can get to the spots. They know where the ball is, and they're constantly measuring that. If Cat, at his size and his athleticism, gets a sliver of that, he becomes really dangerous, really fast. And now it's time for what? The, the ox court. Because every team has a vibe, a, a sense, an effervescence about them. And so you think, who is driving that? The, the Raptors have Kyle Lowry. The Spurs have had Duncan Popovich. They thought Kawhi was going to be another guy added to that list. Miami, is it Pat Rott? Is it Pat Riley? Is it Spo? Is it Jimmy Butler? Who knows? But they're all hard as hell, smart, and disciplined. There is, there is a vibe around these teams. And we've made, what, an allegory, I suppose, to a car all the players in the car and the music that plays around is all the noise that comes. Who has the ox cord? Who's playing the music? Who sets the tone for the team? As you said earlier, Cat, not really a super outspoken guy. D'Lo, a guy who's been on three of the coolest or known as the coolest teams in the NBA thus far, San Francisco, Brooklyn, and LA, a guy who has an outsized fan base because of his time in LA and those three cities, honestly, And a guy whose game is cool, his off-court stuff is suave, he dresses like an icon, he's got this big smile, and he's cool as hell. I think he's setting the tone for the Wolves. 
Yes, I agree. Ricky Rubio is a guy who I think would be in contention just because he is in the NBA. He's had some success. He's made the playoffs, but internationally talk, when you talk about winners, you have to talk about Ricky Rubio. So Ricky Rubio and he's a vet. So he comes in, he gets, he gets guys involved, whether it's on the court, off the court, that's how he is right on the court. He's, he's spraying that ball around. He finds guys in spots that they like in spots that they can be effective. He on, by all accounts, he is exactly that way off the court as well. So he would be a candidate, but I think the guy you nailed it is D'Angelo Russell, just because if the vibe is wrong with him, then the vibe is off with the whole team just because it's not to say that he's a, he's a bad guy. It's just cat is, you know, he's on the court. He can be your leader, but D'Lo feels like the guy who off the court is someone people just gravitate to and whatever that, whatever quality that is, whatever that means, people look to him like he has the answers. And, you know, maybe that time in Golden, maybe this is where that pays off that time in Golden State, that time in Brooklyn where he had to learn and grow and be the guy. So, you know, he'll go as, the team will go as far as D'Lo is, as long as D'Lo's vibe is good with the team, right? As long as everything meshes well, People will look to Cat on some level, Rubio on some level, but they will look to D'Lo first. Yeah, I think the melding of the off-court, happy-go-lucky, enjoyable vibes that D'Lo brings, likable, easy to get along with, that kind of stuff, melded with the sheer, almost unprecedented offensive dominance that Cat brings to the center position, that would be perfect. That melding creates a very high ceiling. And so let's talk about high ceiling. Where are these wolves at their best? And so we have a best lineup that we've both thought of. And for this team, we're thinking of what, do you, what are you trying to be if you're the wolves? What is on the roster? What is in-house that makes you say, okay, this team, they're going to do this. And for the wolves, it seems easy to highlight them as an offensive juggernaut. We've come together with the same five-man lineup that maybe the coach doesn't recognize them as the best team, but we think they'll play a decent amount of minutes and they'll have the best net rating. So one of the best lineups, if not the best, that the Wolves can bring out. And so we both agree on this. It's Carlton Towns at center, Josh Okoji at the four, Anthony Edwards at the three, Malik Beasley at the two, and D'Angelo Russell at the one. What are the offensive and defensive benefits of this lineup? Offensively, it's the ball is in the hands of Cat or D'Lo. You can have Cat just about anywhere on the court. You can have D'Lo in a lot of places on the court. You have Beasley, who's very active off ball. You have Okoji, who, as I said before, he's learning and growing in that off ball role. And then you have Anthony Edwards, who to me is a great unknown, but people understand his game a lot better than I do. So I have yet to see what he is capable of at the NBA level and how engaged he can be as an off-ball defender. But like I said before, if he can be that guy who second-sided tiger or punch gaps, you know, teams are in trouble because Cat's a great passer, because Dilo's a great passer. Defensively, you know, the, their ceiling is how engaged Cat and Edwards are on that end. How active and perhaps how relentless they can be. Because that, because at the end of the day, that team is, that lineup is long. And you talked about this before. It's hard to get cross-court passes off. And if they are a hounding defensive team if they give effort and they communicate and they're loud defensively they could be as not necessarily as dangerous defensively as they are offensively but 
it could be average defense, tremendous offense. And in the NBA, that's sometimes that's all you need. Yeah, you brought up the length to throw these long passes. And in the NBA, it's become that the short pass is the most often made, but the short pass is not the most often looked for, the long passes. So you'll get dump offs and you'll get the one pass away passes towards the end of the shot clock to try and find the guy to take the shot or just for motion early on these little pitch plays. Typically teams want to make the long pass against a shifting defense, against a moving defense. Having a long team that occupies the middle of the floor and especially a team that if Cat isn't known as a great rim defender, you're looking at they're the best in the middle of the floor because they're lengthy everywhere. That forces teams in a lot of cases to beat them with independent creators. Guys like Damian Lillard, guys like Kemba Walker, who can get their own shot, who can run pick and roll, and they just, they take shots in those situations. But against teams like for the Raptors, as an example, when the Raptors run the pick and roll, they're typically not trying to get the ball handler a bucket. They're trying to find a guy in the middle of the lane to go to the basket. Those long arms and the long wingspans of the Wolves against teams that don't want to just work through an independent creator will make every pass that goes over the top or comes near the middle more difficult just by proxy of their length. So are they going to get torched by a team like the, the, the Trailblazers? Probably. Damian Lillard will probably come put like 46 on the Wolves this year because either D'Angelo Russell or Malik Beasley will get caught on screens and they'll have four minutes of good defense where Ricky Rubio is his primary, something like that. But against other teams, they'll be able to stave off these horrible crippling defensive numbers just because they're big and they crowd the floor and that makes it difficult. Then their offense will just take over and maybe against the Blazers, You'll have D'Lo and Cat rolling properly too, and offensively they can keep up. They're an interesting team. What do you think is, when you look at them, ceiling and floor? Let's, let's talk about that right now. Ceiling and floor. When you look at them, how high can they go? How low can they fall? In terms of their floor, man, it could get bad. Even if, if all guys are healthy, you know, if they are slouches defensively, night in and night out, and – They don't bring the effort, especially when you talk about this season being unique to all other seasons, where there are so many restrictions off the court. There's a, when I coach, I like to manage mental fatigue, right? It's this thing of, am I making, I'm making all these decisions. I can stay engaged, but only for so long. And that's fair to expect from everyone really but most especially young people who are young players who are still learning the league so you have to account for that so if everyone stays healthy and that's the biggest thing is you know everything could change based on one one covid test one injury if cat goes down what is this team so if delo goes down things and so on and so forth so Excluding that stuff, just on the court, just if everybody's healthy, things could go bad. If Anthony Edwards, I, like I said, I don't know him. If he pouts at or is not as mentally engaged as you'd expect a number one pick to be, I, they could, it, it could be a free fall. And they're in the West. There is, there's, there's no room for error there. The West is, there are two teams that are probably not competing for the playoffs. That's it. So it could get really bad. Now, if everything clicks, if everything goes right, I could see them in the playoffs making noise, like I said, against a higher seed. Maybe not winning that series, but getting to the playoffs will be a big deal. And It will matter a lot because Cat's only been to the playoffs one time in his career. D'Angelo Russell, once with Brooklyn, I believe. Not a whole lot of playoff experience for those guys. Can they be big game players having not really made the playoffs? I don't think so. Listener, viewer, Evan has this expertise as a coach. 
it's what you've probably come and subscribed to his channel for is that he can pick out a set, he can pick out the minute details that are going on with the game, and he'll make a video of all of it. You're, you're Googling for some reason Brandon Clark's floater, and suddenly an Evan video pops up, and it's like, oh, seven minutes? Perfect. It's every floater this guy put up. Since that's his strength, we've introduced this segment that is just his own. It's called Coach's Corner, and it's where Evan walks through sets that he would like, or one set, or a couple that he would like the team. What are, what are you talking about today? So I'm talking about, I'm projecting forward what a cat Delo pairing could be. So in what we're going to see in Coach's Corner is me going through their one game with the Raptors, seeing the different ways they attack. Sometimes Cat is the screener. Sometimes Cat is the second side attacker. Oftentimes, the end is my favorite part, and you talked about liking this also, the inverted pick and roll with Cat as the ball handler, and they take the smallest guy on the floor and go screen with his man, and just the, the chaos he creates. He's such an offensive force, and you're really maximizing what you can have when you have the ball in his hands. So it's a lot of that. All right, viewer. So that's going to be right away. I hope you enjoy it. And we'll be back to talk the additional notes of the Timberwolves. So something to look at before we get into specific plays is the Minnesota Timberwolves floor spacing. You'll notice them get out in transition here and nobody is really sprinting to the rim. Everybody's sprinting behind the three-point line and that allows for maximum space, driving lanes, everything like that. And the guy like Cat can just go to work. D low side pick and roll where Carl Anthony Towns is the guy spacing up top. The reason this works really well is because he is a great decision maker. Here you see he misses it, but the Wolves get the ball back. He converts. As I said, great decision maker, even better shooter actually. 41.3% from three last season on 7.9 attempts a game. Per cleaning the glass, 101 makes out of 245 attempts on above the break threes. Now we get to see the D'Lo Cat pick and roll. Here, Cat goes straight into the post because he has a small on him. Pascal Siakam comes over with great help defense, forces the miss. Again, they switch. Cat has a small on him. This time he chooses to shoot over the top. Towns is going to flip the ball screen here so D'Lo can get going to his left hand. And D'Lo stops on a dime, pulls back, hits the three. Here's what makes this pairing so dangerous. Cat Delo pick and roll forces the switch. Now Cat goes into second side action. The defense is forced to make a number of decisions. It leads to a Josh Koji duck in. Now, the double drag action is one of the more common actions in the NBA, and we didn't really get to see Russell Towns run it a whole lot in the only game that they played together. But here are some examples of what D'Angelo Russell can do as the ball handler in these situations. You'll see capable playmaker, great passer, A-plus vision. Now we jump right into dribble handoff action. Nas Reed here with the Nas Reed to pitch it back to D'Angelo Russell. Now we get to see Carl Anthony Towns be the decision maker with these fake handoffs. The reason why this works is because a big seeing a handoff has a tendency to relax for just a second, then boom, Cat is just gone, or he's making a great pass. Another option here is to go back door. Wiggins goes up like he's going to receive the handoff. Cat finds him. Now we get to my favorite play and something I hope the Wolves will be running a lot more. Carl Anthony Towns as the ball handler in pick and roll situations, specifically invert pick and roll where the point guard is setting the screen. Here he rejects the screen, late game situation, lefty dunk over Steven Adams. How many players can do that? D'Angelo Russell is going to be the screener this time to get Pascal Siakam on cat. Scal leaves his feet. Carl goes to the free throw line. 
Here, step back over the outstretched arms of Rudy Gobert. Here, brush screen from Jeff Teague goes right to the rack. And now we go into a variation of it where the point guard will pitch it to Carl Anthony Towns. Cat going downhill is so, so dangerous for the defense to have to deal with. And watch this. I just, I don't even know what to say about that. Again, he's seven feet tall, shooting 41% from three, and can absolutely rampage to the rim. Welcome back, viewer or listener, whatever it ends up being. But you just saw Coach's Corner. I hope you liked it. We're about to do a rapid fire round on some of the rest of the Wolves roster. A guy we both like, and I'm just going to bounce this off of Evan, Juancho Hernan Gomez. What do you think? So active off ball, just a great screener. I think he's one of the guys that's really, that's going to benefit the most from Ricky Rubio being back on the Wolves because they are national team teammates. And so he's a guy who, you know, he, like I said, he's a floor raiser. Rubio is going to get guys involved and get the ball in, in guys' spots where they can be most effective. And Wancho is, I think, really, really going to benefit from Rubio being back. Ricky Rubio. What is Rubio doing for this team? Underrated defender. World-class passer. That's another world-class passer on this team. Off ball, I think he has turned himself into more of a threat than he was at the beginning of his career. So is he the guy you're going to have at the end of games? I don't think so because uh, you want the ball in Russell and Towns' hands. And if he turns out to be like a 40% three-point shooter, then yeah, sure, have him out there. But, you know, he's, he's a vet. He's a guy who will put guys in positions to succeed. Yeah, with Rubio, I think what you get is a – a really good point of attack defender that you can just plug into a game to t- kind of deter perhaps another really good point guard or on ball creator that another team has. As far as closing games, we could see that Anthony Edwards first overall picks typically have carte blanche a little bit and they can make mistakes and play through it. If the wolves are trying to make the playoffs, there's probably going to be some games where Ricky Rubio supplants Anthony Edwards, and he just brings that, you know, third ball handler, if you count Cat as a ball handler, he brings that third ball handler, a calm presence for them to run, you know, off ball actions for DeAndre Russell or Carl Anthony Towns during the, you know, pressure cooker of fourth quarter minutes. That's all going to be very valuable. And he's going to work you through some long second quarter minutes or third quarter minutes and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's a big deal. Uh, Ed Boss Davis is there. Everybody kind of knows what Ed Davis does. He's not going to play a lot of minutes. He's going he's gonna to be active on the glass. Rondé Hoss Jefferson, what do you think of his fit with this team? And is he stepping on the toes of Josh Okoji as far as a lot of the defensive prowess he has? So when I went through that Raptors film, Cat played two games against the Raptors. Like you said, Rondé Hoss Jefferson was the primary defender. He's a guy who... He, he can guard up in, in the playoffs or near the end of the bubble. You know, the Raptors just, just gave him the ball because they were resting guys. That's fine. Rondé Hollis Jefferson is a guy who in those two games against the Raptors, Cat played both games. Rondé Hollis Jefferson was Cat's primary defender pretty much. So he'll be a great practice guy for Cat. He, near the end of the bubble, and, you know, in, in garbage time against the Nets, pretty much, the Raptors just gave him the ball and said, you know, just, just go wild, man. So I think he is a guy who is better suited to tell Josh Koji, hey, man, know your role and be really good in it. And, you know, if you, can, if you can meet expectations for your role, then you can try and go past that. But I think there will be a fine balance between those guys just because – how many guys do you really trust in late game situations? Is Rondé Hollis Jefferson a guy who you want out there for extended minutes? No, but is he a, you know, 
offense defense substitution type of guy who you trust his defensive decision making late. I think that's going to be his that's going to be him at his best. Yeah, I'm excited to see if the Cat and D'Lo two man game is really going. They have an advantage. They can press without a bunch of spacing from other players. They have an advantage. They can press against a different team. You sub Rondé Hollis Jefferson in. B ball index had him as a 96 percentile one on one defender last year. And he's also no slouch as a coverage guy or as a post defender. He was one of the better defenders in the league last year, even if his lackluster offense takes away a lot of the uh, net rating advantages that his defense brings. It'll be exciting to see the Wolves have their offense really going, and then they can just plug him in to kind of bump up their defense at times. But he, he'll be situational, and hopefully he's used properly by Ryan Saunders. I feel like that's the Wolves, man. I feel like we just walked through a team. How do you feel? I feel really good. I don't feel as good about not having brought up Jared Culver. Um, <laughs> but to be honest, that's because I don't really, I don't necessarily know what he is because some with D'Lo later in the year, how they're going to use him with both of them on the court. What will he become? Maybe he works really hard and he has a defined role at the beginning of next or this season is coming up. Maybe he has a more defined role. So We'll see about that, but I just wanted to throw him out there just because he is he is on the roster. Yeah, I'll, I'll plug in my thoughts too. It's, he seems caught between a lot of important NBA skills. The shooting, the ball handling, the passing, the defending, all seem like swing skills for him because he brings a legitimate amount of skill to each of those things, but not enough to warrant that as something he does well. So the Wolves are just waiting for that jump in some of those skills so it becomes more clear in how to use him and how to utilize him. So I think if he he brings some of those, if those turn into bona fide attributes in his game, then it becomes a lot more clear in how they're going to use him. I think that's how I feel about Culver. All right, before we get get out of here, do you have any uh, final words for the viewer? Any exciting notes to leave off on? So because of this deep dive into the Wolves, you can expect a Carl Anthony Towns video. I'm contemplating a D'Angelo Russell video just because, you know, he played for two teams. And so you're trying to mesh that. Robert Covington is a guy who we're going to talk about. Spoiler, we're going to talk about the Blazers. But because he was on the Wolves earlier this, this past season, I have a lot of film on him from the Wolves. So he's a guy you can expect a defense video on Robert Covington. Good. Um, anything else? I feel like that's, that's it. Yeah. So Samson seems to not really enjoy when I do this, but I'm going to continue to do this. He's a good friend and a great writer. And, you know, this is, this is fun for us to do. Just talk hoops. And hopefully you guys enjoy it, but please check out his stuff. I don't say that just because he's here. I really do enjoy his writing. And he's actually a guy who not, this is a compliment for me to say to people, but not necessarily for people to receive. He is a guy who I can see if he wanted to coach, he, he, I could see he would, he has the acumen for it. He has, I don't know if he has the patience for it, but I could see him coaching one day. So Please check out his stuff. We'll have all of our social. Evan, thank you so much for the kind words. If you want to read my stuff, there there will be links provided. Obviously, you're on Evan's channel, so you, you're a fan and you enjoy the stuff he talks about and the stuff that he notices and makes videos about. So look forward to more of that from him. Look more forward to more episodes of this from us. Seven teams. Maybe we squeeze in a fan favorite team at the end if these do well. But... First, you're looking at the Wolves. The next one is the Hawks. I hope you enjoy that one as well. Thank you for tuning in. It's been a blast. Take it easy.